I bet you can't imagine a world without the internet. Yet 20 years ago, most of us had never been online. Email, Facebook, Twitter, Skype. We live in a connected world. We tweet our heroes. If we need something, we Google it. If we miss it, we watch it again on YouTube. We can educate ourselves for free, and we can blog, make our voices heard, spark revolutions. The internet brings hope of progress and democratic change. But does it really? Detractors say there is no such thing as internet freedom. Information overload makes us lazy. Free content debases our culture. Advertising is targeted to manipulate our choices. And mass online state surveillance erodes our civil liberties, destroys our privacy, and subjects us to censorship and oppression. Without security, liberty is fragile. Without liberty, security is oppressive. My name is Mehdi Hassan, and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head to head with Jimmy Wales, founder of Wikipedia, one of the unchallenged giants of the internet era. The online encyclopedia, which is written by thousands of us and read by hundreds of millions of us, is all about spreading the sum of human knowledge to the whole of mankind. But is it degrading our knowledge, dumbing us down, and can it survive in the face of the growing threat to internet freedom? <laughs> To help find the answers, I'll be joined by four experts. Herman Shinnery Hesse, known as the Bill Gates of Africa, Bob Ayers, a former US intelligence officer, Isabella Sankey from the human rights organization Liberty, and Oliver Cam, a columnist for the Times of London. Ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Wales. Thanks for coming on. Jimmy, Wikipedia. Yes. Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Massive. Yes. 19 billion page views a month. 500 million unique users, more than 4.3 million articles in English alone. Did you ever think it would be this big, this transformative, when um, you kicked it off, I think, what, 2001, 12 years 2001. ago, 13 years ago? Well, I, I remember looking at a list uh, that I found of the top 100 website. And so I thought at the time, you know, if we do a really good job, we might make it in the top 100 or the top 50. At that time, it wasn't clear that an encyclopedia um, would rate, you know, much higher than that. And you know now we're number five in the world. So in, in a sense, I was always very optimistic, but um, I never really anticipated uh, becoming part of the infrastructure of the world in the way that we have. And you have become part of the infrastructure of the world. We'll, we'll come on to that. You, you said once that Wikipedia is all about giving, quote, every single person on the planet free access to the sum of all human knowledge. Now, that's an ambitious goal. I'm just wondering how close you think you are to realizing it. Is it even possible to realize such a goal? Well, it, it is an ambitious goal, and in fact, I think one of the reasons that Wikipedia has been so successful uh, is that it's exciting to people. Like this idea, this vision of everyone in the world having access to a basic encyclopedia so they can get started learning whatever it is they want. A few years back, I, I tried to refine that goal to be a little more quantitative about it, and I said, look, we want to have at least 250,000 articles in every language that has at least one million uh, native speakers. Turns out there's about 350 languages like that. Um, we're in about 280 languages. But we're seeing a lot of growth. Uh, we're seeing growth sometimes in very surprising places. And it's become part of our kind of everyday conversation, like when you Google something, now you Wikipedia something. I mean, just since we're here in the heart of Oxford University, let's just take a show of hands from the audience here. Who here, and be honest, has used, accessed, read either wittingly or unwittingly a Wikipedia article in the last, I don't know, 30 days? Raise your hands. <laughs> that was too okay. easy. Come well, on. Okay, let's turn it, let's turn <laughs> it on its head. <laughs> Who here has never used Wikipedia? Raise your hands. Okay, literally no one. That's a zero on our, on our audience sample. So this is a massive, massive thing. And the question then becomes, can an online encyclopedia with these ambitious goals that anyone can edit, can it be a truly accurate, reliable, high-quality source of content? 
Well, I mean, that is the interesting question that has been with us from the beginning. Um, and the way we, we look at it is we want to be uh, Britannica or better quality. That is our goal. Um, and when we think about how to get to that goal, one of the important things to understand about Wikipedia is that it's a dialogue, it's a discussion, it's a, you know, everything is open to revision, everything is open to discussion, debate, to challenge. Um, what does that mean? It means that sometimes you'll go to an entry and it'll have a big warning at the top. Uh, the neutrality of this article has been disputed. Uh, that means the community is struggling over whether this is accurate or not, uh, struggling over whether it has uh, reliable sources. You talk about the community, mm -hmm. and yet how can a teenager sitting in his bedroom be accorded the same weight and credibility and authority as a tenured professor on a subject that may be the specialist subject, the lifetime research of that professor? Well, what we find is that the, the best tenured professors really enjoy meeting that teenager who is really good at that subject. What if he's not and really good, though? Well, <laughs> what if no the one's professor's checking. not really good? Because that sometimes but At least happens. he's a professor. Yeah. At least he's a professor. The guy who created Wikipedia with you, Larry Sanger, he says Wikipedia lacks credibility because of, quote, anti-elitism or lack of respect for expertise. Now, that's undeniable, isn't it? That's a misunderstanding. We are not anti-elitist. Um, we're anti-credentialist. We are very elitist in the sense that we want people who know what they're talking about. But if you rock up in Wikipedia and say, I'm not listening to this debate and argument, I'm going to shut the whole thing down by saying, I'm a professor, so I don't have to prove what I say, you're just going to get shut down on Wikipedia to say that's not a legitimate form of debate. And like I say, the best academics embrace that. They understand that. Just coming back to say things like reliability and accuracy. So you talk about Britannica, etc. So I looked at my own Wikipedia page before I came here today. And my Wikipedia page <laughs> says I'm either born in 1979 or I'm born in 1980, which makes me sound kind of mysterious, like a spy. <laughs> uh, which is kind of cool, but then yeah. I have to ask myself, basically, does, is, that, is, is what that is really telling me is, I can't really take this seriously as a source of information. I think it's, I mean, that's a really good example because it means you can take it seriously because you know the community has struggled with the question and they didn't just have some could editor. Have asked me. Could have asked you. Um, how, when were you born? 1979. 1979. It's going to be right. corrected now right. before the program goes out on air. Now we have a reliable source. I mean, Philip Roth, one of the world's most famous mm. novelists, you'll remember in 2012 wrote an open letter in the New Yorker to Wikipedia yes. saying that when he had tried to contact Wikipedia to correct what he believed to be a factual inaccuracy about one of his novels in the Wikipedia entry, he was told by a Wikipedia administrator, I understand your point that the author is the greatest authority on their own work, but we require secondary sources. <laughs> That's a bit absurd, come on. It, it's not absurd because when, when we get an email uh, from a completely unconfirmed and unconfirmable address that says, I'm Philip Roth and this is what you've got wrong, well, really, are you Philip Roth? How do we know this is true? And then also, how is it verifiable for other people? We can't just sort of change it with a footnote and says, he told us so. Um, we need something a little bit more than that. I mean, one of the funny things about Wikipedia, despite being this crazy new thing from the internet, is how very old-fashioned we are in a way. That we're always looking for a reliable source. We're always looking to say, look, we don't want to make the judgment call if we can help it. Forget me, forget Philip Roth. Your own Wikipedia page mm -hmm. describes you as the co-founder of Wikipedia with Larry Sanger, a point you dispute. You say you're the mm. founder and you tried to change your own page but couldn't. Mm. That's well, a bit embarrassing. <laughs> 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 yeah, a bit, but, um, you know, again, it's, it's a question of uh, what the sources say. So do you so. think Wikipedia is wrong about you? Um, I think the media is wrong about me, and so therefore Wikipedia accurately reflects that. So, <laughs> so is I'm quite proud of it. Is I'm quite proud of it. Even there, I an can't manipulate Wikipedia. An important philosophical question. Is yeah. there virtue in accurately reflecting something that is inaccurate? Um, it's a good question. Sometimes people would make the mistake of thinking, oh, Wikipedia doesn't care about the truth, it has just verifiability. And we have examples where, look, a consensus of thoughtful editors will agree this particular source is wrong at this particular time. But in general, what we look for is verifiability. And uh, one person's opinion is generally not enough to overturn that. There's also the issue, of course, of really, really contentious issues that people feel strongly mm. about on lots of different sides. A few years ago, I believe, an Israeli lobbying group was uh, accused of having encouraging its members to become become Wikipedia editors so that they could control the narrative on the Israeli conflict. How then can I take any pages on Wikipedia seriously about Israel-Palestine? There's one model people have of, of how Wikipedia should work, which is a battleground. So the battleground is 
Wikipedia will get to neutrality because people from different sides will fight it out until they somehow have to come to a compromise. We reject that approach. That approach is not healthy. That approach just leads to endless conflict. Instead, what we'd like to say is, look, Wikipedia, every Wikipedia editor has a responsibility to try to be neutral, to try to take into account uh, different perspectives on an issue. Um, and if there is no Who one... Who enforces that? Who watches the watches? Oh, the community. I mean, we, we all watch each other. I mean, it's and, and, and this is a key point that but if we did if the community have, itself. So, for example, right. I believe there have been studies done. You say people study mm, Wikipedia. Yeah. I believe there have been studies done that show that 80 to 90 percent of Wikipedia editors are male, yes. young men. Yes. How can a group of Wikipedia editors who are a bunch of young men, presumably a lot of them living in the West, especially for English language, how can they be said to be neutral? How can they reflect mm. diverse viewpoints? How it, can they... Is, this is absolutely correct. I mean, one of the things that we struggle with at Wikipedia is that even if you have a group of really well-meaning people who try really hard to incorporate different points of view, um, there will be things that they miss because of their own context. There will be things that they don't think of, things that biases that they don't even notice because they're swimming in it. Um, and uh, what we want to do is bring in more editors, more diversity. The Wikipedia community calls you, I believe, BDFL, Benevolent <laughs> Dictator for Life, because you have the casting vote when there are big disputes. I'm just wondering how benevolent your dictatorship is. Um, well, the Wikipedia community does not call me benevolent dictator for life. Uh, the New York Times said that. I think that'd be one of the cases where um, we would say uh, it's, it's verifiable but not true, so <laughs> we, we probably shouldn't have it. Uh, in fact, we've always rejected that model. Let me bring in uh, some of our expert panelists who are here tonight. Oliver Cam is a columnist and leader writer for The Times. Oliver, in 2007, you wrote an article for The Times in which you said Wikipedia relied on the, quote, dumbness not the wisdom of crowds. Now, Jimmy is saying it's the crowd is what makes it reliable, it's what makes the interaction, it gives it superiority over traditional encyclopedias. My objection to Wikipedia, um, maybe use the phrase anti-elitist, you responded by saying it's anti-credentialist. My objection to Wikipedia is that it's anti-intellectual. I've never come across an academic enthused by the subject who's unwilling to discuss it or to debate the, um, the, the, the subject matter. The problem with Wikipedia is that you're democratic, not in the sense of no one has the last word by credentials, but anyone can join in. There is no way in which Wikipedia can filter genuine scholarship from amateur enthusiasm. Your view of Wikipedia is just simply false. Um, this idea that we would regard everybody's opinion as equally valid, this is not true. The open model is, is absolutely subject to some difficulties and weaknesses, but such as uh, democracy. You know, this view that somehow Wikipedia is anti-intellectual is, is false. I mean, we're, we're absolutely in the tradition, the Enlightenment tradition of reason, debate, and discussion, um, and openness to new ideas. That's preposterous, Mr. Wales. Your <laughs> model you. is one of <laughs> arriving at conclusions by consensus, and scholarship doesn't work like that. It works by conflict, and it works by derision of ideas that are bad. You approach truth by a completely different avenue, which is getting the largest number of people to agree with a particular so summary. One of the things we reject in the Wikipedia community is the concept of voting. We don't vote on what's right. So it's not about the largest number of people. It's about the arguments that are reasoned. It's about making your case. It's about proving your point, preferably with uh, the, the best and highest quality reliable sources, which is exactly the academic approach. It's exactly what we want from scholarship. Uh, is okay, me I mean, of course, some scholars are combative, some newspaper writers are combative, but <laughs> we don't have to let's, be that way let's to arrive in, at the truth. Let me bring in Herman Chinnery uh, Hesse. He's a software entrepreneur from Ghana. Uh, he's been described as the Bill Gates of Africa, and he was shaking his head there as <laughs> Oliver was speaking. Uh, I, you, you don't share Oliver's um, critique of Wikipedia? Not necessarily. I, I think some of his critiques are actually agreeing with him. Uh, the sense of no one central gospel, which is, it seems to be key in the Wikipedia statement. I'm not saying that everything is perfect. There are issues. But coming from Africa, as for me, Wikipedia works beautifully. It goes to the bush. It goes on the internet. It goes on a $100 uh, PCs. It's not perfect, but it's almost there. How has the open model, Jimmy's phrase, or the crowdsource model, how has it affected developing countries in well, your experience? I don't know that it affected uh, my part of the world 
significantly yet, but I'm quite excited because when Africans start to participate, we'll finally get to tell our story. And, and the whole, this whole notion of uh, there's no big tyrant on the top determining will work very well for us. And yeah, finally, we'll hear Africa's story. I have one of the things that I'm, I'm really passionate about. This is my phone. Uh, this, a friend of mine bought this for me on the street in, in Kenya. Uh, it's a Google phone, so Android, uh, you know, so web browser. Uh, this, com this is available now for about $50, unlocked 3G phone, and they've sold hundreds of thousands of them in Kenya, in Kenya alone. And so this, we are now finally, and one of the things we're doing is we're working with the mobile carriers so that they'll bring Wikipedia on mobile phones with zero data charges. So one of the things that's really important that's going on in the world in the next five to 10 years, which is faster than a lot of people thought, is the next billion people are gonna come online. They're gonna start participating and joining, uh, learning and teaching. Um, I'm, for me, this is, this is the most exciting moment in history. Are you glad that Wikipedia is putting other mainstream, traditional, old-fashioned sources of knowledge, encyclopedias, out of business? Is that a good thing? Do you see that as a, because you are. So I'm just wondering if you think it's a good thing or do you, do you have a tinge of regret? I, you know, I, I think um, I, you could ask Thomas Edison about the candle. Um, <laughs> you haven't discovered penicillin or electricity. You've set up a website. Your extraordinary self-grandiosity is one of the most revealing things I've heard this evening. So the interesting thing is I have done nothing, and that is absolutely true. But there's a kid, Jack Andreka, who's just invented a, uh, a test for pancreatic cancer that cost, uh, I think, one five thousandth of what the, last, uh, the previous test cost. Um, and he did this by using Wikipedia and open access research and things online. He's uh, 17 years old. So knowledge is not about anything that I've accomplished. Knowledge is about empowering everyone, anyone, to learn what it is they want to know. Let's take a step back from Wikipedia and just on a wider point of the power of the internet and the transformative power of the internet. I just want to talk about some of the kind of the social implications. I mean, I, I spend much of my time on Twitter. And I love it, and I couldn't live without it. But there's no doubt that it takes up a great deal of my time as a husband or as a father or as an employee. And I just wonder how damaging has it been to our social interactions, to the time we spend with our families and our communities in the real world? You know, for me, just speaking of, of my life, I have managed, despite moving away from my hometown, I've managed to reconnect with, with friends from childhood. Um, and, you know, I know about their children and I keep up with them. And this would not have been possible without this, without this tool, to both leave home and maintain those long-term friendships. That's just one person's life, one person's example. Um, I, I don't see very many downsides in this at all. Some of the Wikipedia editors, you know, these are volunteers, spend around 14 hours a day online. That can't be healthy. <laughs> 14 hours, that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> it's more than me. You're going to crack the whip. <laughs> I want the that's 16. more than me. Uh, I don't know if it's healthy or not. Um, I'm not sure um, what these people would be doing otherwise. Um, certainly, <laughs> would, would they be watching television? Would they be, you know, what, what else would they be doing with their time? When people talk about kind of internet addiction, is that yeah. something you oh, recognize? Oh, uh, yes, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's entirely possible. I do think we have to be careful about the reward structure of some of these things. They're, they're, they're made like uh, video games in a way, um, with, with all the research into how to give people tiny little rewards along the way and keep them motivated. Um, and uh, just something to be cautious about, for sure. There are, in the list of positives, I think many people would say that one of the positives, especially in recent years, is that the internet and social networks in particular seem to drive democracy. We saw that in the Arab Spring. A lot of commentaries and articles and books were published saying the role of Twitter and Facebook uh, in those revolutions. And you once said that Wikipedia, quote, is obviously not the place to come and organize a protest. But am I right in saying that you do believe that <coughs> nonetheless Wikipedia has played a role in building democracy or, or in encouraging revolutions? Um, How so, if that's... Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, and, and what I say is, you know, Twitter and Facebook have proven to be very valuable tools for people uh, to self-organize, to go out in the street, to demand things, uh, to raise awareness about corruption. You know, there are a lot of different elements of this that have been very good. But if we really want to establish um, healthier societies, better societies, it is a place to get started. It's a place to start learning um, about these issues, learning about what's possible in other places. Let me bring in uh, Isabella Sankey, who is policy director for the British human rights group Liberty. Um, when you hear uh, analysts saying that 
we have this transformative potential, Twitter or Facebook or Wikipedia has helped drive the Arab Spring or, or th revolutions in former communist countries. What's your response as a human rights activist? There's absolutely no doubt that the internet has been an incredibly transformative tool. It's a kind of unprecedented social experiment and we've seen, as both of you I think have acknowledged, the huge benefits for freedom of expression, collective action, protest and democracy. It's a great democratising tool at its best. Um, as a human rights advocate, free speech is of course incredibly important as is democracy itself. But our concerns, um, and I think they've been brought to light very much in the revelations we've had um, from, from Edward Snowden, is that when the internet becomes um, mastered by our governments, whether they are outwardly oppressive governments or perhaps more oppressive in secret, it can become a tool of oppression itself um, if it's not properly regulated, if those with um, a huge amount of power on the internet, the, le the leaders of internet companies, are not responsible and standing up to uh, requests from governments to, to, to master the internet and know all our, all our secrets. Would you accept that point from Isabel? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the the internet is a tool and it is not automatically a tool for good um, and we need to be very w aware and very cautious about um, lots of actually infrastructure issues. Just to give one example, uh, Google has generally been quite good about uh, encryption. They encrypted uh, Gmail quite early on. Uh, I believe their, their data centers they keep very secure but they they missed a, a trick because the lines between their data centers weren't encrypted and apparently the NSA was tapping into those and now they're quickly sort of working to do well, that. That's an, that's an example of infrastru an infrastructure mistake. A lot of people um, believe Wikipedia is linked to WikiLeaks. Mm. People always have, because of the name yeah, and yeah, of yeah. course they're not linked in any way. No. I'm just wondering, is there any bad blood between you guys at Wikipedia and the folks over at WikiLeaks. I read somewhere that you're not a big fan of Julian Assange. I've never met Julian Assange, uh, so I don't know him personally. Um, I find him in email to be excessively combative, and most people who've had any dealings with him seem to come away with the same sort of impression. Um, he and Oliver might get along very well. Um, <laughs> but um, the... Um, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I think for Julian Assange, for, for WikiLeaks uh, and Julian Assange, I think I have mixed feelings about the whole thing. Certainly, we, we need, it's, it's crucial and important that in open societies that we have ways for people who no have knowledge of wrongdoing to be able to come forward to make public what they know uh, in a safe way. That is absolutely uh, a, a good and important thing. Um, at the same time, I think that WikiLeaks has been a bit loose about what they publish and when they publish it and how they publish it. Um, and so I'm, I'm concerned about that. Are you annoyed they took the name? No, I mean, yeah, it, only because people ask me if I'm annoyed every day and that's annoying, but... Um, <laughs> Once I was coming into the UK and I forgot to fill out on my landing card, I forgot to fill out occupation. And the woman said, oh, you know, occupation. I said, oh, I'm the founder of Wikipedia. And she dropped her pen, WikiLeaks. I said, Different guy, not wanted in Sweden. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to go to a break right now. Uh, join us in part two when we're going to be talking about the NSA spying scandal, the role of online technology firms in it. And we're also going to hear from our audience here at the Oxford Union uh, who are waiting to come in and put their questions to Jimmy Wells. So come back after the break for part two of Head to Head. <laughs> Welcome back to part two of Head to Head. We're here in the Oxford Union with Jimmy Wales, founder of Wikipedia, the world's fifth biggest website, the online encyclopedia. We're talking about the internet, its transformative potential, uh, the reach of sites like Wikipedia. Jimmy, I want to ask you this question. Is it time for President Obama, for the US Congress, to rein in the National Security Agency, the NSA, which has been accused of archiving, accessing, collecting, data mining our online electronic communications? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's I think it's it's incredibly important. Um, I think that it's incredibly damaging and embarrassing to the U.S. Uh, I think it makes very 
difficult for, uh, for someone like me to go out as I do and speak to people in authoritarian countries and say, uh, you know, you shouldn't be spying on activists, you shouldn't be censoring the internet, when we're complicit in these acts of extraordinary intrusion into people's personal lives. So um, I do think that it's time to take a really hard look at it. What's more important is it's time that we really have the public debate that we didn't have the opportunity to have before we started doing this. I think if you put it to a vote uh, of the general public, they would have never approved this kind of sweeping surveillance program. Uh, this is something that, that was rejected, uh, you know, decades before um, when we started thinking about uh, phone tapping uh, and things like this. So it's, it's definitely time for a major reevaluation. Do you think the your fellow internet moguls, if I can call them that, the, the, the bosses of uh, Google and Yahoo and Microsoft and Facebook, do you think they did enough to prevent the NSA from surveilling, spying the data of ordinary users online? For each company and each situation, there may be a different judgment that we come to in the fullness of time and in the, in the richness of history as we come to understand all this. Uh, in general, what I find is that uh, at, the, at the major internet companies, uh, Google has of course been in a leadership position on this, uh, there's been uh, astonishment uh, that this was going on um, and, and anger. According to documents leaked to The Guardian by Edward Snowden, Microsoft collaborated closely with the NSA and the FBI to allow its own encryption software to be circumvented, to allow its own uh, users' communications to be intercepted. That's pretty outrageous, isn't it? It's completely outrageous, if true. Uh, certainly, I think it's time now that it's been revealed for the government to, to confirm it or disconfirm it. Um, it's outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. Have um, you and I would any not dealings yourself? with the National Security Agency? No, we've had no, no dealings whatsoever. They've um, never approached you never to approached try and us, get yeah. better access to the data? No, never. Um, we, we were outraged when uh, one slide emerged uh, uh, that discussed uh, spying on what people are reading in Wikipedia, so we promptly accelerated our efforts, which were underway already, to encrypt every connection uh, to Wikipedia, and that's still an ongoing process that we're working on. Um, because it's, uh, it's unconscionable uh, to, to do this. To, are to you worried wholesale. that they might not just be looking out for people who are reading Wikipedia, but you, you talked about your community. The editors uh, are communicating uh, with each other, intercepting their communications. Yeah, absolutely, and there's no question that people who are editing Wikipedia in, in some jurisdictions are, are putting themselves at risk by, by doing so. And we want to protect those people. Those people are heroes who are editing Wikipedia from Iran about political topics that are sensitive there. Um, you, you want those people to be safe. You want them to be able to speak the truth without fear of being spied on. It's the principle that applies everywhere. Uh, human rights aren't um, negotiable. What's your view of Edward Snowden, given you think that some of the stuff that's been revealed is outrageous? Given everything that I know today, um, he's a hero. Um, he's a person who's been very careful um, in, the, in the materials that he has leaked. They have been in the abstract. He hasn't leaked anything that would put any particular agents uh, at risk and so forth. Um, he has exposed what I believe to be uh, very likely to be judged uh, criminal wrongdoing, lying to Congress, um, and certainly uh, a shock and an affront to, uh, in America, an affront to the Fourth Amendment. Um, and I think that history will judge him very favorably. Has all of this made you <coughs> think again about where you locate Wikipedia's servers? Because I believe they're located in the United States, in Florida. Th Have you thought about relocating them because of what you've learned? Um, we haven't given it any really serious thought. I mean, the U.S. remains a very good jurisdiction for things like uh, freedom of speech, uh, for the the uh, you know for the right of people to express themselves freely online, uh, for the the safeguards for an internet company, um, and so. We would consider it, but so far we haven't seen anything that would make us want to leave the U.S. There is a growing concern in Congress uh, about this sort of thing, a growing sense in Congress uh, that, the, that the public's angry about this, that, uh, that they've been misled as to what was actually going on, um, and I think we're going to see legislation um, to change this. And if I have anything to do with it, we will. Okay, well, let's... Uh, go back to our panel uh, who are here in the Oxford Union. Bob Ayres, you're a former intelligence officer. You've worked with the CIA and with the NSA. Jimmy talks about <coughs> the wrongdoing that's been exposed, potential criminality and violation of the Constitution. Uh, what's your response to that? The NSA collects foreign intelligence information. They collect it on behalf of the United States government. The government, realizing that they operate in a secret community in a classified world, has put in place two different committees to oversee all intelligence operations in the U.S., one in the Senate and one in the House. So when we say 
rein in the NSA, that's very pejorative because the NSA is conducting a mission authorized by the government, supervised by the government, and overseen by the government. In October 2011, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which is mandated with overseeing their activities, said that some of the surveillance programs carried out by the NSA uh, were deficient on statutory and constitutional grounds. They may be a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Senators on those committees you've mentioned, like Senator Ron Wyden, Senator Mark Udall, have said, we were misled. We have not been given the full information. The head of the NSA has admitted to misleading Congress. There's a difference between misleading Congress and misleading the oversight mechanism that's responsible for seeing what they're doing. Congress is a public body. No, he went in front of that intelligence committee and misled them. It is He's amazing, to that. It is amazing <laughs> how many representatives find themselves misled when the public sentiment turns against something that they were aware of. <laughs> okay, so you're saying he was misleading them with their collusion. No, what I'm saying is he was, he, he was relating to them what the operations were that the NSA was conducting. At the time they were relating it, it was okay, no problem with that, we understand, keep up the good work, boys. Suddenly it makes the press, everyone's outraged, and it's like the scene in Casablanca, where suddenly they say, my God, there's gambling going on here. <laughs> Okay, One of the take, people in the Senate denied even having been briefed on intelligence let's operations. Take a, let's take a step back and ask a, a wider question about principle. Should the NSA have the right, the ability, to spy on the, okay, surveil, access the emails, for example, of everyone in this room, British why, citizens and residents? Why not? Isabella Sankey, why not? Privacy and the right to privacy is a very important, uh, integral value. It's something that, um, that gives us our dignity at its most fundamental level. Um, we've never believed in mass surveillance previously. The, the reason why both of uh, th these countries fought the Second World War is because um, we believed in the inherent dignity uh, and, and, and respect for fundamental human rights and freedoms. And what it looks like has happened um, over the last few years is that very gently these, these principles have been badly, badly eroded. Oliver Cam. So long as there is sufficient regulatory oversight, so long as there are independent commissioners who've held high judicial office, um, who have to sign off on intercepting electronic communications, then I think it's necessary because there are people who want to destroy our indeed, way of life. Indeed there are, but Oliver, accessing Angela Merkel's electronic communications didn't help kill Osama bin Laden, did it? No, that was, that was preposterous. May I make a point about Edward Snowden, who, if he were a hero, would have faced the consequences legally of what he did and not fled to a state that imprisons feminist activists, intimidates gay activists and murders journalists. You're talking about Russia there. Herman, I just want to bring you in here. <laughs> Um, <laughs> just in case people weren't across where Edward Snowden happens to be. Uh, Her Herman, in a continent like Africa, do you think certain unsavoury regimes may look at what's going on and say, actually, we'll have a bit of this, if they're not already doing a bit of this? Yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, in my country, I feel, I think they we're monitored a bit. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't, I'm not naive about this. It's a difficult, dirty job. Maybe I'm jaded, but that's just how the world works. I don't think anybody has a problem with the idea of targeted surveillance. When somebody is suspected of serious wrongdoing, um, it's definitely justified with the, with the appropriate checks and balances to put somebody else under surveillance, whether that's interception, whether it's um, bugging, whether it's following somebody um, in a car, whatever, whatever the technique might be. What's problematic here is mass surveillance. Once you establish the principle that says some degree of surveillance is acceptable, whether it's steaming open letters, whether it's intercepting Western Union telegraphs between different embassies. Once you buy into the principle that it's okay, now you're only arguing degree. And terms like ma- It's so important. I, well, and, when, no, and when you're talking stop, about- Wait, stop, stop, stop. I let you speak. Let me speak, please. When you say things like mass surveillance, I mean, what constitutes mass? Is it 97% of the people in the world? 20% of the people Bob, in the world? Bob, you said everyone it's in pejorative. this room earlier, didn't you? That's pretty mass surveillance. <laughs> uh, you had one thing that people don't seem to grasp when we're talking about, quote, mass surveillance, is what the intelligence organizations are collecting is raw information. They're not even looking at it. They use computers to filter messages to That's try to- looking at it that is looking at it. Just because a computer's doing it doesn't mean it's not being looked at, filtered, that words are being looked it at. It has and to be looked at to be delivered. 
So they are looking at it. So they're intercepting it. They're collecting it. They're the, intercepting the, it. And the they're looking at it. The concept that somebody is reading some little old lady from Birmingham's Christmas message to her grandchildren is absolutely ridiculous. The computers no, are reading a, it's it. It's a little old lady in Germany. Um, <laughs> Jimmy, um, <laughs> what's your response to what Bob's saying? Well, I, I think it's a mistake to, I mean, to, to this idea that it's, it's merely a matter of degree is a big mistake. It is a matter of principle. There is a principle difference between targeting an individual or a group of people, going to a judge who is an independent judge, and getting a court order based on probable cause is very different from surveilling everyone who is of an Arabic descent, there's a, there's a broader group, or how about everyone in this room or everyone at all? I mean, that principle, the principle of judicial oversight is, it, it, is not a degree, that's an either or. You're either doing it, you've either got those checks and balances or you don't. And, 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 and we could stop 100% of burglary in this country. It's quite easy to do, I'll tell you how to do it. Cameras are getting cheaper and cheaper. The government can put a camera in everybody's home, including your bedroom, because you often have your valuables there. All the data will stream into uh, GCHQ, and um, nobody will look at it. Uh, does that sound like a good idea? It would stop burglary. But I think most of us find that incredibly unnerving, invasive, intrusive, and also the moral justification that you then have in totalitarian countries to say, well, look, Britain does it. We're going to do the same thing. Okay. And by the way, well, a few people are going to disappear. Because putting of the it. NSA issue to one side for a moment, the big internet companies we mentioned before, like Google and Facebook, etc., are generating billions of dollars for themselves in profits by using our data, by using our personal information to target ads at us. Hasn't the internet simply become another tool for big corporations just to make money out of us? It's a trade-off. For me, I'm happy that Facebook is finally showing me ads that seem at least a little bit relevant. <laughs> but I think we should be concerned about the amount of data that is being collected. How is it being stored? What is it being done with it? Um, and these are big issues that we're all going to grapple with in the coming years. I don't think it's a very simple uh, thing to do. At, at Wikipedia, we're quite uh, strict about uh, our, our view of these things. We, for example, we only collect one out of every thousand hits uh, to the website for traffic analysis and then we delete the logs as quickly as we can, as soon as we can run the stats. Uh, because we believe uh, if, if a government comes to us and says, I want to know what mehdi has been reading, um, we can say, look, we don't know. Um, and, and we will fight for that principle. That is very important to us. Wikipedia, of course, is a non-profit. We are a non-profit, um, yeah. Google, Facebook, Twitters of this world have made people like Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey into billionaires. You're not a billionaire. Does that frustrate you sometimes? <laughs> Uh, no, no, I don't. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, as, as was identified earlier, I, I live in a uh, with breathtaking arrogance, and so that's enough for me. <laughs> I came, I came across a quote of yours where you said making Wikipedia a non-profit was quote either the dumbest thing I ever did or the smartest thing I ever did. I'm just wondering if you've worked out yet whether it was smartest <laughs> or dumbest. <laughs> no, it was the smartest thing I ever did. Um, you know, I, I think. Uh, Wikipedia wouldn't be what it is today um, if, if it were anything other than the, the structure we have it in. W one of the reasons, people sometimes say, well, why don't you put ads in Wikipedia? Why don't you put ads in Wikipedia? And one of the reasons is in the DNA of the, of the nonprofit, of the Wikimedia Foundation, we care as much about the next million readers in Ghana as we care about the next million readers in California. And if we were driven by ad revenue, we would not only care uh, to get more readers in wealthy Western countries, we would also care what you're reading. We would be thinking about what is the revenue per page. So we don't. We don't do any, anything like that. Uh, and, and so we have no incentive to take your data um, and try and get you to read certain things versus other things. We just okay. burn the data and you read what you like. Let's, on that note, go to our audience. Who here would like to make a point or ask a question uh, to Jimmy Wells? Let's go to the lady here in the front row. As a student, Wikipedia often helps me to sort of streamline my thoughts and kind of Get, like, get things organized when my tutor really doesn't approve. Why do you think <coughs> Wikipedia is often misunderstood as devaluing education in some way? The question is not should students use Wikipedia, because they all do, without question, but how should they? Um, and so I think that a tutor should say, right, all you know is what you've read in Wikipedia. You're at Oxford, frankly, that's not enough, right? It's a tool, it's a tool like, and, and the same thing, uh, by the way, is absolutely true of Britannica. Oliver, very briefly wanted to come in. Academics object to using Britannica because it's a summary of primary and secondary sources. They reasonably object to Wikipedia because they've no idea if it's true. 
OK, let's go to the, back to the audience. <laughs> Gentleman there in the blue jacket on to my left. I think we've got some language problems going on here. Uh, may, it might be like a British-American thing, but when you talk about democratisation on the internet, I see d demonetization. And when you talk about freedom of information, I see millions of people working for free. And these are very, very different things. Um, I think there are some myths about the internet. One of these is the idea that open source or the hive mind is, is really good at generating stuff. It might work for Wikipedia, but you can't have 10,000 people write a novel or a concerto or make a film. I, I absolutely agree. A thousand people can't write a novel together. A thousand people can't make a film together. Um, a thousand people can learn how to make a film. A thousand people can study things. A thousand people can share ideas and enter into an intellectual community that generates a lot of excitement and interest and, and support. Demonetization is a legitimate fear people have had that you know, because of the internet, we're going to have a complete collapse in some of the creative industries, doesn't appear to be coming true. Let's go back to the audience. Lady right there at the back there. What really strikes me um, when I read in Wikipedia is the number of people that we can find. Are there some criteria of um, how influential they must be to be listed? There are limits to what is in Wikipedia and there are limits to what can be in Wikipedia. I always uh, give the example, um, I could write a wonderful biography of my mother, for example. Um, I know her life story and she's a wonderful person, but um, no one else could verify it. And I don't anticipate in the future we'll have a profile on everyone uh, because I think it would violate the idea that uh, everything in Wikipedia should be verifiable. Okay. Let's go back to the audience. Uh, lady here in the green scarf to my right. There are a lot of holes in Wikipedia's coverage, um, especially of topics in the developing world. So how do you think this problem will be solved? Yeah, I, I think it's a crucial, uh, it's a crucial point for Wikipedia. Um, we now have a community that's been together uh, for several years. They have uh, gained a great deal of expertise in how to write an encyclopedia. They've thought through a lot of interesting discussions, dialogues, debates. The danger that we have is that we become a bit too insular and that we're not welcoming enough to newcomers um, and that we have a narrow view of what belongs in the encyclopedia. I was once in uh, South Africa and I was taken by a journalist to um, a, a restaurant in uh, Guguletu and I wrote a little entry about it in Wikipedia which was immediately nominated for deletion when in fact this is a restaurant that had uh, a big and interesting cultural role in South Africa. You know it was an apartheid era story and so on. Um, and that's, a, that's bad. That's bad if a community thinks, uh, well, if I've never heard of it, it can't be important. And so we do try to fight that. Uh, nothing about Wikipedia is, is magical or automatic. It's very human. Um, and so I really want to say, you know, anyone here um, who comes from a perspective that's not your sort of 26-year-old male tech geek, which is the bulk of our community, please get involved. Gentleman here in the leather jacket on the second row. Jimmy correctly mentioned um, Iran as one of the governments that restricts internet uh, and its population doesn't have access to um, free information. And we have this bizarre situation where you have the supreme leader, you have the president of Iran, you have the foreign minister, all use social media tools like Facebook and Twitter to appeal to the international public opinion, to manipulate the international public opinion, whereas for the population itself these tools are illegal and they're filtered. Um, should this unfair advantage be removed? Should their accounts be disabled? Uh, that's a very good question. It's an interesting argument I've never heard before. I know if I were Twitter, I would think about that. Um, I would consider that. I certainly would say, you know, if, if in a country I found out that um, the, the only IP addresses that were editing Wikipedia were from the government and everybody else was blocked, um, I think we would block those IP addresses. So I think in our case, we would probably uh, take Has that, that action. Have you done that in the past? Uh, no, no. I mean, that, that exact example hasn't happened. It's a hypothetical. We, we have blocked, um, well, we blocked the House of Representatives in the U.S. once, but uh, <laughs> that was for juvenile vandalism. Um, we let unlike, them back if they promised to behave. That's unlike Congress. Uh, let's go back to the audience. I'm going to take someone from the back. Gentleman right at the back with glasses and the goatee beard, he's been waiting for a while. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask, because I've been to the doctor's office a few times and caught him looking up my symptoms on Wikipedia. Um, so I wanted to ask, 
on that note, do you think it's dangerous to be over-reliant on any one source of information, particularly something online? Um, and on a related note, um, what do you think is Wikipedia's impact on the future of institutional education, particularly in the developing world? Thank you. Mm, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it is, it is always dangerous to rely on any one source of information. It's interesting, surveys done of, of medical students, how many of them use Wikipedia, it's surprising and maybe a little bit alarming. Um, but it, the, the impact of Wikipedia on education, particularly in the developing world, um, that I think there are many different impacts. Uh, so w one of the things to, to remember about the world today in general, not just in the developing world, is that the amount of formal education that's going on is more or less stable, but informal learning has uh, exploded, radically exploded. That's happening, of course, in the developing world, where oftentimes people don't have good access to formal education, so they're educating themselves. When they get access, um, you know, they're, they're getting online and they're learning things that are of interest to them, and they're joining the conversation. Let's take some more questions from the audience. Lady here in front of me in the second row, just on the end, yes. Do you think it is right for private companies to be asked to police the internet on behalf of the large entertainment corporations? One of the most important things that the internet is giving us is an open platform for open conversation and creativity, um, and that's really critically important. And any measure that we take to help copyright owners defend their rights um, must not interfere with that free flow of information. And that is really the crux of it. Um, that is really the tricky part. We, we have to remember there's a lot of alarmism going on about uh, the situation with copyrights and so on. Um, and, and we have a situation where, um, you know, in, in the past, uh, copyright law only really, it was an industrial regulation. Uh, it affected only big companies in a direct way. Now it affects everyone in this room. I mean, if you, if you have a, a, you know, your kid's birthday party, and you film it, and then you decide, oh, this would be really fun to set to a soundtrack. So you get in iMovie, and you make a little movie, and you put the soundtrack of a pop song on, and you upload it to YouTube, and you send the link to grandma, and grandma comes in and she says, I, I don't know why I can't hear the sound. Oh, it's because Google automatically disabled it as a copyright violation. Um, that's problematic. That's fair use. You know, that's just people trying to, to, to use the tools of creativity available to them. And to equate that with piracy as just one example is a huge mistake. One last question to you. If Jimmy Wales decided, actually, I'd like to go back and be a futures trader again, or I'd like to go and try and be a billionaire like Mark Zuckerberg and, and quit it all and went off and did something differently, could Wikipedia survive? Would um, it survive? Yes. Without yes. its benevolent dictator? Yeah, 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 completely. I mean, uh, the, the, the process of the last 12 years has been, for me, uh, the process of, of turning myself into the ceremonial monarch. Um, it will be, it, it, Wikipedia doesn't need me or depend on me uh, to move forward, and that's as it should be. Well, on that note, Jimmy Wells, thank you very much for coming on Head to Head. Thank you very much to our audience here in the Oxford Union for contributing. Thank you very much to you all at home uh, for watching tonight. This debate will continue, where else? Online. Thanks for watching Head to Head tonight.